Okay, so uh, hey guys, so this this would be the last talk. So I, I know it's getting late. So I will try to wrap this up in around 20 minutes. Um, so uh, introduce again. I'm Mark. I work at Vicky, and uh, um, my day-to-day -day thing is uh, goal related. Okay. So uh, so today I'm gonna talk about the garbage collector. So how many of you know what Go garbage collector is and have like tinkering something with it? Yeah. Okay. So I, I hope this this is um like short introduction to maybe to look into it in the future if you run into problems. Um. So uh, what to expect uh, from the talk would be uh, at first I will go about uh, some uh, historical information like how memory allocation was done in C. And then we'll look at how it's done in Go. So on this is the reason why we need the garbage collector in Go. And then uh, we'll see it in action. And uh, well, then we'll see some uh, consequences of the garbage collector. So do it fast. So history, um, if, you, if you come from a C or C++ background, then uh, you used to have to allocate and deallocate memory manually. And then if you do that, you would remember that there's uh, two things, the stack and the heap, right? Um, if you call the function and then you declare, like for example, this this program is just simple finding the max of two number, right? And in C, if you declare something in the function and then don't use it, um, I mean, then uh, it, it will basically live on the stack. Stack is just a uh, space in the uh, virtual memory where um, you allocate uh, this function, uh, this variable, and then when you exit this function max, which means you are uh, um, at the you come to here, and then uh, it exit the function. The space uh, for that, the stack space for that function will be deallocated. So in effect, this is why um, in C you cannot access variable in another function. So it's like local variable, right? But I can write um, this in another way. Is that um, instead of returning the value, I return the pointer to another uh, address space, right? Um, so like for example, this one in uh, the max function, I allocate some space. So this go on to a different space called the heap. And then um, I assign the value of the larger number to it. So it goes here. And then when I exit the function, uh, the stack for the max function is deallocated. But I still have the address of some memory space with the value of the larger number. So uh, in effect, this is how C used to deal with uh, like local variable and then uh, share variable. Uh, so anything that's shared goes to the heap, and then uh, anything that's local go to the stack. And then um, you would, if you notice here at the end, I would have to do a free on the uh, memory that I allocated. So anything goes to heap will uh, stay there until you deallocate them. So that's C. Then uh, we, let's go back to Go. Um, so now in Go, the code um, to do the, the max function sort look the same. So uh, I have a result here, and then I assign the uh, value to it, right? So can any of you guys guess, um, like, will this be on the stack or the heap? How many stack? One. You guys, the rest? OK. Uh, yeah, so this, um, yeah, so it kind of go to some space that is similar to the stack uh, in C, right? Uh, but in Go, actually, there's no concept about stack or heap, um, but it knows um, which variable goes where. Uh, so I'll elaborate it in the, in a bit more. So then, uh, okay, so now I have this function, uh, this program. So this is um, simply, I have a Go first truck. I take a function, I have a function that takes in two gopher, uh, two gopher struct pointer, and then produce a new gopher struct pointer. Um, okay, and if you look at it, it's interesting because in this read function, uh, right, I take two, uh, I produce a go struct, and then I return the address of it. And then I can use that information outside. So if you remember the example we see back then, right, if I declare something in the function, it will be local. It will be in the stack, and nobody outside can access it. Right? So, so how come I can get this value here and display? 
Um, so this um, this is essentially um, like the quirk and the benefit of Go um, is that it knows when your return address or your variable, um, like whether it, it, it's going to be shared among um, other Go routine or not. Um, and it allocate that information to the stack and the heap accordingly. Uh, and if you notice, at this point, I don't have to do any memory deallocation at all, right? So where does that variable go? Like, I mean, it occupies some memory, right? So what happened to that? So um, that brings us to the garbage collector. So uh, the point of the garbage collector is to look for these uh, like unused, unallocated space that nobody care about, and it will deallocate them. Um, okay, so I'll do a very quick uh, like example to see how it works. So anyone, are you guys following so far? Like any question? Okay, so that's the ugly. Okay, so. Okay, so what I have here is a very simple HTTP server. Um, all right, so it, it lists and serves on uh, 9,099, uh, and then uh, what it does is um, it returns a JSON, uh, which is marshaled from a uh, Go first truck. And if you look at it, this is the same as the, uh, the second Go example I gave where I allocate some uh, struct inside the function, return the address, and uh, um, don't do anything. So what will happen now is that um, I'm going to compile this thing. And then I will run it without the GC. Right. OK, so now it's running. Um, so let's uh, oh, okay. okay. So I mean, to 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 know what does the GC do, just turn it off, and then you see the effect like immediately. Um, so. Okay. Okay, so okay, so what I'm printing here is um, the uh, what I'm printing here is the memory usage of this uh, server. So RFS means um, total memory usage in RAM, and then VSZ is virtual virtual memory, right? So you see that the virtual is a bit more because uh, okay, I don't know what uh, account for that. But um, okay, so now what so I will do. How much is that? Is that 3,000? Uh, all all of this is in bytes. So 3 megabytes. It's in bytes? Uh, if oh, I'm not wrong. Megabytes, huh? um, oh, it's 1,000. Yeah, yeah, it's 1,000, so it's kilobyte, yeah. 3 kilobytes something. So, oh, sorry. Uh, so it's what? Like 3 megs, 7 megs. So yes. 8 megs, right? So, what I'm doing now is I'm going to run a benchmark tool, which basically bombard this server with a lot of requests. Right, and then you see it right away what happened without the GC. So now you notice that the memory usage of the server increased like a lot. It's not that much considering nothing's being free. Oh. Well, why isn't it going up the yeah. limit? It doesn't work anymore. Why is that? Mm. Oh, sorry, I run it wrongly. Oh. When, when it's working. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. basically, this is when it's working. It only. So, um, let me run it again with the. Is WRK your own tool or is that part of your GC off? Um, WRK is some. If you use like AB, the benchmarking yeah. tool for Apache before, it's yeah, similar. Yeah. Uh, there's is another it your own guy. Tool or is that a, a um, yeah, it's another guy um, project. Uh -huh. Okay. 
so I'll run it again with the GC off. What, what did you, oh, GOC, GOGC. GOGC off. Okay. And uh, let's find the process again. You need to do a P, bro. Yeah, <laughs> I like this better. Okay. And then uh, bombard it. So now it explodes, right? And it will keep coming and it will crash my computer, so I'll stop. Uh, but if you... Uh, you can put, put that in a system D and limit the memory, yeah. so, and then restart always. Yep. Um, so now... Okay, so now I, I'm going to look at the memory profile of uh, the server within this span of time. So um, pprof is a benchmarking utility. So this. So can uh, I tell you exactly what I mean? Yeah. So, so right now, without the GC, is and a few seconds running the benchmark, it's already eating two hundred something megabyte. If I let it run like fully, it will be around eight hundred megabyte, and you don't want the server to consume this much memory, right? So. So then what happened when we run it with the GC? Well, why is it the memory being stuck in that, that strange function read mine or something? Isn't it? Shouldn't, yeah. it be, shouldn't it be stuck in the gopher? Uh, well, because it's uh, decoding, uh, decoding it with this one. Uh, I thought the memory is getting stuck in the, in the gopher struct or whatever. It's very small. It's not being free. Right. So I'll just bombard it again. Uh, I'll, I'll get to your point like later. So we'll see what is actually being leaked and causing this memory bump. Um, so yeah, now it uh, looks much better. Right. And then. It's not perfect, Yeah. So I'll look at the memory profile again. Web. Okay, so this this time it's only using around two megabyte. Right. So that that's um th this is very good. Uh, consider that um it without the GC, um it's taking like ten uh forty times the amount, right? So the GC makes a very big difference. So why what difference does it make here? So we we'll go back to the program. And now I would compile it with the So this will basically run the compiler and showing all the information that it detects about memory. And then if you notice, there's a part here. Right? So there was a pointer to a struct that escaped to heap. And if you remember about C, if it stays in heap, it will stay forever until somebody free it. So this is the guy that is uh, actually leaking from our example. And without the GC, anything that you leak in your memory, stay there. Right? So that's what the GC is meant to solve. And it solves a lot of pain problems because if you remember back to the C day, um, like the allocating memory and correctly is a pain. Can I have to go back to the code for that line? Yes, yeah, so it's the code. This one? This is new. The server? Uh, yeah, 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 the, yeah the, the code. I, 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 that means it's. Yeah, sure. So I ran it with uh, minus GC flex. Um, no, I think that's the main thing. The code is very scared. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so. Sorry, no highlighting. Um, so here, right? So I allocate some struct, and then uh, I return the address outside. So I mean, in similar to say this would be a memory leak, but because of Go have a GC, it don't leak out so much. Right. So. Um, okay. What does it, it tell you that in the SVG? Uh, oh, it's just a way for it to display information, the benchmarking. Too. I don't dis dis deal with that. So the dash end sounds a lot better. Yeah. 
if you didn't know about it, then you screwed. When you run a very big production server, you don't know all the nook and crank. Yeah. Right, so they're yeah, looking at. Well, it's good that you told me about that. I just wish that Big Prof could tell you, could tell you that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, why should you, as a programmer, care about the GC? So, one thing it, it's, it's making your life much better, and by right, it, would just, it should just stay there silently without you knowing. But um, actually, when you run a highly performance system, the effect of the GC is real and it can be painful for you if you don't know about it. So, uh, for example, if you run a HTTP server, um, at this point, Go 1.4 has um, stopped the work, mark and script GC, which means when it tries to GC, it will stop everything, no response handling for you, right? And what, what that means is uh, during that time, any client connecting to that server will be um, staff of request. And uh, okay, so like we have a similar problem in uh, Viki at some time ago. Um, we was looking at the timeout graph for our uh, API client, right? And then we started to notice that uh, periodically there would be a spike in timeout. It go down, it go up very um, periodically, right? So we, we tried to invest and we found out, oh, actually we are being GC because we put too much stuff in memory that at some point it will start GC and the GC takes too long. So this would be, the interval would be around one, two seconds. Um, and that was not a good experience for any of our clients. Right. Um, so that's one. Now if you think about a more critical system, say you are writing a system to transfer money, this, become, it, this could become a potential big problem. So like in this use case, I would have two service A and B talking to each other. So A send a money transfer request to B, and then uh, the protocol may be said in that, like um, as long as B acknowledged, then the, money, uh, the transfer was successful, and then don't do anything else, otherwise retry. And then um, if B, say it's in Go or some Java thing, could be also a Ruby or Python, whatever, anything with GC, and uh, it get uh, GC at that point, and if the GC is a stop the work, then B will not be able to respond to A at all. Um, at the same time, if uh, you implement like timeout on A, saying that if the B guy doesn't respond to you after some time, then retry, um, you could get into this situation where B came back from GC, ran the uh, transaction, uh, send the acknowledge back, but that happened before this guy sent another transfer request, and uh, without any proper checksum, then you somebody get double the uh, money that they're supposed to get. That's good for them, but you are in trouble. Right. So um, I mean, this this there's a lot of if in this scenario, but um, just think about it in terms of backend. Like, is there any service that you are writing uh, and with a client who implement a timeout? So you could cause trouble for them if you don't respond timely, right? So, uh, so this is uh, some extra stuff. Like if you know, want to uh, fix this problem, you have to understand your G GC. And uh, doing that is meaning of looking at um, like your memory performance and uh, tuning it with certain things. Like may maybe um, you want to GC very early. So you can set a uh, go GC to some X number, which is a percentage so, uh, of your total memory space, for example. So if it reach um, around that number, it will start to GC. So the time you spend on GC is much shorter. Um, you can turn it off entirely if you don't want it, but um, this means you have to write very C-like code, and that's hard. And then uh, you can change it on the fly. And then there's other tools like what I just used uh, to benchmark and look at the memory performance. So yeah, with that, uh, I, I hope I'm not running out of time. So I would like to end the talk. Um, so I'm open to question. Uh, you mentioned the, the pre-1.4 behavior. Sorry, I didn't. Um, uh, so what's the behavior? What's the current version? 1.5 or 1.4? 1.4. 1.4 still stops. Still stops. Yeah, the 1.5 version. Right, so they, they are planning so that in 1.5 the GC run concurrently, um, which means that it doesn't stop anything. It might cause some slight overhead, 
but uh, not as serious of stopping anything mm -hmm. else. Almost application in the stop the whole thing is like very few milliseconds. It doesn't really, uh, affect much. But if you have like sixty frames per second, you need to do something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so, um, how does this thing know which part of memory is going to be right? Um, so, oh, right. So, which part of the memory is local, and which part should go to the hip, right? That's your question. Which part be swept away? So in Java or any other languages, right, there's a reference counter. Oh, OK. If the reference goes to zero, then it should be swept away. Uh, in Java, there's no such thing. Um, yeah, how do you feel in memory? Um, I think it goes and look at, um, right, I, I forgot the actual implementation of it. Um, I mean, if you go and look at the internal GC code, then they will have a detailed implementation. I, I forgot how they actually do it because um, it, mostly I just look at it and yeah. But uh, I don't think they do reference scouting. Yeah. Um, uh, then, yeah. How big were your processors which cost like one, two seconds garbage Oh, so we were trying to do a Mem in memory cache ourselves. So we have a map and then we just dump like this request, map to the response. And then we have a lot of requests without any proper like canonization. So it could easily, um, um, I think we were storing like 10 gig of stuff in the memory. That's, I mean, that, that was a bad implementation it's, that we fixed it. But uh, so what are you doing? Each request you're storing it, and then give you uh, right. So we cache it, right? So if each, if the next request coming with the same UIL, then oh. we return it. The cache response. So it's just like a very simple cache. Yeah. So we was trying that uh, for some time, but uh, it ran into this only small problem. Yeah. Um, so allocate less memory. We canonize the UIL. So now, like, say if your request come with a query, so you could have a lot of different query, but maybe most of them, um, I mean, it depends on your scheme, but maybe most of them re result to the same response. Then I canonize them, and then I just return that. So I, I have less uh, space in my map. For example, so that's an example. Some people like drop in varnish for this, that sort of use case. Yeah. Do you use Varnish uh, or do you use that Go line stuff? Uh, we still have some part of it in Go. Um, we have a Vanish. Yeah. We can tell more about that. Vanish and uh, API proxy GC thing. Uh -huh. right. What's the exact question? How did we solve it eventually? The Go GC. GC API proxy? Yeah. The issue of the software world GC? Yeah. So what we've been doing is, uh, we actually run GC every 60 seconds. So we never let a GC reach a point where it has to throw out a huge number of objects. I've actually brought it down to probably 600 seconds on 60 seconds for the process. But every 10 minutes I have GC running. And because I never really have, we never really have huge number of objects by the stop the world time is very small. It's enough. Nothing times out of the I think with the latest Go version, it became much better. Mm. Uh, and right? the next one is gonna be concurrent also. Yeah, so it, it used to still be a problem with the previous version, the latest version is become better. Just running, yeah, we're just running it every 10 minutes and I reach up to like I have 40 to 50 GB of data in my process, but uh, my GC manages to run under 200 to 300 milliseconds. So even if once in a while, every 10 minutes, it will run. It's a very small time period for which 200 to 300 milliseconds. So, that's 200 that's milliseconds is a lot. Of it okay. can be, but it's much better than. So it used to grow to like one second, two second, three second. Oh, okay. so, and rather than taking a three second hit every hour, I rather take a 200 millisecond hit every 10 minutes. Yeah. 
programs. Huh? Is it uh, possible to go to write programs which doesn't, which when I start without the GC, don't leave any memory and it's predictable? Like for example, I want to write the software which controls my quadruple curve. Right. You don't, you don't want the GC and then you yeah, want I to manually. Want the GC to be uh, I it's possible. It's possible. You would have to pre allocate your memory. So you'll have to have global objects. And then, I mean, okay, if I, uh, for a moment I take out the, go back to the C model, right? I mean, that's how we do the C program, but you don't want to do any runtime allocation at all. Because right? you have your memory allocated in space and you have your objects allocated. So basically, you just follow objects and one main loop, and that's it. Correct, that's it. You never allocate or pre allocate. You never allocate and pre allocate. But you will have to estimate your max object that you can handle yeah. in advance, and that's your limit. Yeah. Uh, in case in small software, like yeah. what you're performing, I think that's a quite nice workaround. Yeah, yeah, No, it is it's practically used in, like in embedded systems, it's used all the time. So, embedded that's the way the model, nobody will allocate on your plan. Nobody will just, you estimate your limits, you allocate memory, Right, you map your object to that memory, so it's pre warmed when your program starts up, and then it's just from a pool you keep using allocation. That's true. You could technically do that. If, yeah, we probably not investigate that yet. So, any more questions? I'm just curious, uh, are your processors still about like, 10 gigs and GC does run a couple of weeks? So, uh, we don't allocate too many objects. What are uh, most of our data is like cached in memory cache, and it is being actually used. So we don't. Well, I've, I'll be honest. I've not done too much analysis because I'm getting the performance that I need. My suspicion there is uh, I don't have too much deallocation happening. Uh, too many pointers that need to be deallocated. From the GCS perspective, but okay, all these objects have a reference, and therefore I'm not going to bother looking at it. And GC is probably just handling small number of objects uh, to be, you know, using some cache. I know for like V8, uh, right? So as long as you, even you have like a one gig of memory, it starts a slow down because V8 kind of like try to move, uh, move your memory. A bit. So we have no, no, we use we have a Redis level cache and then we have uh, in memory cache on top of that. So in memory is like you get sub millisecond response time. So if it's in memory is like a request is there in cache given it's like on the that it's literally because of a 0 0.00 sub millisecond. If it's ready, it will start doing it single digit, double digit milliseconds. So I can always kill my memory cache. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Any more questions? Okay, so if that, then uh, I would like to close the meetup. Thanks for coming. Uh, I guess it's late, but if you want to move more, then uh, it's Ampiran. It's, um, I'm leading the platform team. And it's me and then there's some guys at the back. So. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm.